gendered racial terror was an attempt to think about the ways in which gender has been so entrenched in the history of racial violence um, in the US. And part of the reason that I thought it was important to do that in the context of writing a history of uh, imprisoned women in the South after the Civil War is really, it, it was in many ways a political question because so much of the narrative um, around racial violence has privileged masculinist subjects, and in particular, many of the most mainstream accounts of the carceral state and its development situated the carceral state as part of a long history of racial violence in which um, black women were really erased. And so I wanted to center um, the, the regimes of violence and technologies of violence that black women suffered. But I also wanted to emphasize and highlight and elaborate the ways in which um, ideologies of gender and in particular black women's exclusion from normative femininity um, made those forms of violence possible, made the carceral state possible. And so that was a formation that helped me to answer those questions um, and to really think about the mutual constitution of gender and race in constructing both institutions uh, or institutions, discourses, and um, political structures of violence. Violence against imprisoned women um, after the Civil War in the context of convict lease camps and chain gangs really did establish white supremacy in a range of ways. Um, I'm really drawing in my analysis of imprisoned women's experiences of violence and drawing from Hortense Spillers' analyses of ungendering in which she argues that both interiorized and exteriorized modes of violence um, produced the modern world. Um, interiorized and exteriorized modes of violence against black women. And the chain gang really exemplifies that in the sense that black women were subjected to um, the same labor demands as, as were imposed upon black men. They were forced to lay railroad lines and build brick and um, do agricultural work and do street road construction. They were uh, subjected to whipping with the same degree as, um, as was imposed upon imprisoned men. And they were also uh, subjected to um, institutionalized rape and sexual violence, um, much of which was made public through displays of their bodies um, on county roads, in public areas, within wide view. Um, and so I wanted to map out the ways in which that interiorized and exteriorized violence proceeded and was imposed following slavery. Spillers focuses on the period of slavery, but of course emphasizes um, its afterlife as Saidiya Hartman. So I wanted to focus on um, those forms of violence as establishing white supremacy um, in its myriad forms. So in its cultural life through cultural discourses of black women's inferiority, but also in its economic life, that the forms of, that essentially rape and other forms of sexual violence were so entrenched that they operated as an essential benefit to prison guards, um, like pay or time off. A access to black women's bodies was a basic entitlement of uh, doing the work of guarding convict camps, and therefore was essential to the operation of convict police camps and chain gangs. It was really core to um, the production of economic value in those institutions, which was really how the South and in, in particular in Georgia, where I focus, it's really how um, Georgia industrialized, right? Um, it is also true that black women's reproductive labor, the work of cooking, cleaning, mending clothes, um, 
was critical to the operation of, of Southern prisons and convict camps. And so black women were forced under intense violence to reproduce the condition, conditions of their own captivity and the captivity of all other um, people in prison and camps. And so I was trying to do two things. One is to do a social uh, history of, of the experiences of violence to which black women were subjected, but also to chart the ways in which that violence was critical, um, was indispensable to the very fabric of a white supremacist political economy. Hortense Spillers' theory of ungendering was critical to the analysis um, that I tried to develop in No Mercy here. And one of the ways that I thought about ungendering and gendered racial terror is that black women were exposed to modes of violence, all the modes of violence um, from which white women were protected. So black women in many ways operated as flexible subjects. They were, uh, as, as under slavery, they were subjected to rape um, on an institutionalized level. They were made to do work that was um, expected of imprisoned men. There were also ways in which they were positioned in relationship to white femininity. So they were forced to work for white women um, as a condition of their parole without pay in domestic servitude. And that was a sort of specific form of labor that only black women were subjected to and it positioned them in relationship to white femininity, but not as feminine subjects, right? And so white femininity is really operating in this history as a limit, as a signal um, of humanity and the construction of a fully human subject. And black women are positioned as sort of everything that exists in opposition to white femininity. And so engendering is certainly influential in that way but so is Hortense Spillers' conception of vestibularity. And she argues that uh, black women are vestibular in the sense that they um, expose to the world everything that a human is not, right? And it, it's the positioning of imprisoned black women in relation to um, both men, all men and white women that um, really reestablishes their um, position as vestibular subjects under white supremacy in this moment. I was trying to think about the ways in which race comes into operation through gender in particular institutional modalities and sites. I wanted to interrogate um, particular aspects of the carceral regime, um, labor under parole, reproductive labor, um, industrial labor, the ways in which um, the very cultural landscape of the convict camp, its layout, its gendered order, um, modes of gender isolation, the ways in which black women were sometimes um, imprisoned in camps as the only women or one of only a few women, um, how the very structure of particular institutions um, reified race as a gendered process. And I was influenced in this regard very much by Jennifer Morgan's work on uh, transatlantic slavery in which she demonstrates powerfully that discourses and ideologies of, of gender were crucial to establishing um, blackness as a site of absolute difference and um, as a site of absolute difference, as a gendered site of absolute difference critical to the legitimation of slavery. And so her work as a model um, really propelled me to think about the way such discourses and specific technologies were operating in um, discrete sites of carceral.
pastoral violence. Having said that, though, I was also equally influenced by Dylan Rodriguez's notion of um, carcerality as a regime, as um, critical to the establishment and consolidation of a broad white supremacist order rather than simply mapped out in particular apparatuses or institutional sites. So I tried to delve into um, historical specificity, into um, the relationship between architectures of in, um, carceral institutions and discourse as a way to build an argument about a broader regime, a broader um, structure of power that is both concentrated and diffuse, that operates in particular mo moments through what um, Hortense Fillers calls pornotroping, the ways in which violence, particular modes of violence, render Black women flesh in a given moment through a particular practice, but how um, the accumulation of those practices, the performance of those practices, the circulation of discourse really um, amounts to the fabric and landscape of white supremacist ideology itself it becomes necessary for a broad um, cultural life of white supremacy. It was important to me to think really expansively about uh, black women's modes of refusal of carceral violence, really influenced um, powerfully by Tara Hunter's book, To Joy My Freedom, in which she establishes that black women's resistance um, was really an, a threat to the um, entire functioning, um, economic functioning of the New South. And so I wanted to think about its impact on carceral systems and structures. And I was also really influenced by um, questions around agency that scholars such as Saidia Hartman um, have developed and also questions around the archive that numerous scholars, including Hartman, have theorized. And so I wanted to think about refusal in a few ways. One is refusal as manifested physically and through um, imprisoned black women's cultural production, cultural circulation, as a critique of power, as a critique of the carceral state that really was in some ways a precursor to what we would think of today as critical race feminism. There are ways in which their cultural works and um, writing undermine concepts that are so fundamental to the law that they really amount to a quite beautiful and elaborate critique of legal thinking and legal structures. So for example, both imprisoned women and um, popular blues artists really challenged the ideas of objectivity. They positioned themselves as arbiters of experience and therefore innocent and guilt. In, um, who is innocent and who is guilty. They fundamentally sort of critiqued binaries of innocence and guilt. Um, they established the law not as a universal apparatus or discourse or doctrine that can speak for all, but fundamentally steeped and structured through power. They um, circulated analyses of intersectionality, you know, um, that really proceed really Crenshaw's um, landmark analysis that precede the Kambahi River Collective's um, analysis of interlocking oppression. So I was really committed to thinking about imprisoned women as theorists of power, both through their words and songs, but also through their action, their decisions to, say, target the warden's house um, when they were engaging in arson practices. Right, as a critique of the sexual violence that he had perpetrated. Um, so I wanted to think about imprisoned black women as strategists. I also wanted to think about really important and yet difficult to ascertain modes of maybe not refusal, but 
modes of um, sociality and relationality that manifest in care inside the prison. And this is a thing, those practices are really in many ways erased from the archival record. And so I um, tried to use different strategies of speculation um, in order to in, in order to pose questions really about survival, um, about black women's relationships to each other, how they may have um, held each other in ways that um, were critical to their survival and in ways that are eclipsed and erased in the archive as a structure of violence and power. Uh, so that was another um, critical tool um, that I tried to employ in really trying to get at the range of um, the range of ways that black women both undermine the system, theorize the system. I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop. Um, I tried to use speculation to get at the ways in which black women undermine the system materially, sabotage the system through their critique, and um, cared and loved for each other in ways that um, enabled them to get through um, get through the violence they were experiencing with some level of self intact in order to um, have different lives perhaps when they reach the outside. I think it should be noted that anti-carceral feminism is critical and has been for um, a very long time to critiques of racial violence. I think of work by Angela Davis, both her interviews in the 1970s and her work on um, prison abolition as um, central to the genealogy of feminist thought on racial violence. I think of Beth Ritchie's work on carceral feminism, Emily Thuma's work on um, anti-carceral feminism in the 1970s and 1960s, the broader field of um, history around black, black women and the carceral state. So work by Callie Gross and Cheryl Hicks, Lisa LaFloria, Lakeisha Simmons, um, work in the field of critical race feminism by scholars including Priscilla O'Chan. I think of all of this work as really um, required reading for thinking about the long history of racial violence um, in, in the US and beyond, um, but also for thinking about um, how we might build another possible world, right? How another world is possible as abolitionists activists and scholars have demanded that we consider um, in really centering the role of gendered terror in the um, development of the carceral state. I also think the, it, um, it's critically important to turn to activist scholars like Mariam Kaba um, for analyses of um, the critical role of the policing of criminalized survivors of, um, or the criminalization, sorry, of survivors of racial violence um, in the US. So I, I think it'd be great to um, really continue to center these analyses in our feminist repertoire of, um, of tools to, to, to undermine racial violence.